Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 10. Normally I have a bunch of slides with pictures and everything. This morning I have one slide. That's it. So we're going to focus on this, this passage out of John 10. Uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. But I want to read the entire uh, section just to remind you, if you've been studying with us, John 9 and 10 are all really one narrative. In John 9, Jesus heals a man that was born blind. He'd never seen anything. Jesus heals him. It's on the Sabbath. Uh, that creates a stir, a controversy. So then the Pharisees get involved, and then the neighbors get involved. And then they interview this guy twice. They interview his parents. They decide to kick him out to excommunicate him from their synagogue, which would be like our church. So they tell him he can't come back to church anymore. Wouldn't you think that if you saw a bona fide miracle, the last thing you would think to do is kick him out of the church? So you've had a bona fide miracle and you go to GCC, and we can't explain that because our pea brains can't understand that, so get out. No, man, that's what they did. So then Jesus goes to him and comforts him and tells him, I am your Savior. I'm more than just the guy that healed you. I am... I am your provider, your protector, I'm your, the way, the truth, the life. So he follows Jesus. Then Jesus in John 10, he turns around and focuses his attention to these Pharisees and says, I'm a good shepherd, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. You guys are terrible shepherds. You don't even know what it means. You're terrible leaders. You're thieves, you're robbers. Verse 10, the thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he basically, last week we looked at what a good shepherd looks like. A good shepherd does three things. Jesus said in verses 1 through 6, a good shepherd knows his sheep. Jesus knows his sheep. Jesus knows you intimately. He knows everything about you, and he still chose to save you and love you. That's pretty impressive. Like usually you meet somebody and you see them at their best, and then by the time you're married to him and got three kids you find out I'm not sure I like this person <laughs> well Jesus knew ahead of time who I was and everything I would ever do wrong and he chose me anyway he knows me he knows you there's a great old worship song it's probably 25 years old he knows my name he knows my every thought he sees when I fall he knows the hairs of your head he knows the thoughts and intents of your heart and he still loves you Jesus said I know my sheep you don't even know yours you're not even remotely acquainted to your sheep, nor do you want to know them. Number two, Jesus said, I protect and provide for my sheep, verses 7 through 10. You don't. You don't care about your sheep. You care about lining your own pockets. You don't care about your sheep. You don't care if they're eaten by wolves. You don't care if they wander off and get hurt. You don't care. I do. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I, I, provide, I provide for my sheep. I protect my sheep. The third thing he said was, I sacrifice for my sheep. Not only do I lay down now, for them, I, I'm the door, I lay down in the sheepfold, I will one day lay down my life for my sheep on the cross. So that's where we left it. Now in verse 22, I, I do want to read the rest of this chapter, and then we're going to come back and focus on this section up here. So if you have your Bible open to John 10, look at verse 22, and, we'll, and I'm just going to quickly read the rest of that chapter. Then the festival of, uh, festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. And it was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. Colonnade. The Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I did tell you, and you don't believe, Jesus answered them. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe me because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. I give to them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? We aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, isn't it written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called those whom the word of God came to gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, you, do you say you are blaspheming the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? If I'm not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. 
But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. Then they were trying again to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. So he departed again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier, and he remained there. Many came to him and said, John never did a sign, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. Many believed in him there. The Bible says... In Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All we like sheep have gone astray. Then in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 27 and 28, when, when, Peter, when Paul was leaving the church in Ephesus, and going to start a new church in a new town. He'd been there for three years. And he's giving his farewell address to the elders, to the leaders, the men that are going to lead that church after he's gone. And here's what he says to them. Verse 27 and 28. I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Flock. For which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as an overseer to shepherd the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Ephesus was a very cultured, refined city. Uh, highly educated people, highly cultured people. Art, philosophy, history, museums. And yet Paul, when he was giving his last address to his leaders, his closest friends there, he didn't say... Um, Take care of the church of God, which is the body of Christ, and he's the head. He didn't use any number of, of pictures that we have in the Scripture for what the church is. He said, feed the church of God, which he has given you to shepherd them. So this, this whole picture of, of you and I being sheep and him being the shepherd is very important to God. All we like sheep have gone astray. So we tend, there's two things at play here. One, we tend to go astray. How many of y'all would say, yeah, I, that's me. I, I can't, I, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. That's one of my favorite hymns And that verse, that third verse is why that's one of my favorite hymns. Because I am prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I feel like the Lord has to keep me kind of chained close to him because if he ever lets me loose in the yard, I'm going to run wild. I mean, that's just the way I'm wired. So prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. So come thou found of every blessing. I'm a sheep. I'm prone to wander. So that's part of this equation. Here's the second part of this equation. I was curious this week. I didn't know if anybody had any quantifiable research on this. So I just did a Google search. And I asked the question, how many commercials advertisements do do I get in a day I know so the first answer came up and I said nah that ain't right there's no way so then I found a second source and a third source and a fourth source that all said the same thing did you know that according to Google and they're always right and I don't know any better way to quantify this. If you do, please let me know afterward because I'd really like to know this. But everything I found this week in my research tells me that you and I get, are you sitting down, between four and 10,000 commercials, advertisements a day. Every day. Between four and 10,000. So here on one side of this equation, you have me that's prone to wander. On the other side, you have 4,000 to 10,000 people every day saying to me, come this way, listen to me. No, 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 listen to me. No, listen to me. No, I don't listen to them, listen to me. I really know. Hey, I'm the attorney you need if you have a car wreck. I'm the guy you need to talk to for, for Social Security. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the car we have is the car you need. You need this car. You can't live without this car. We get, my word, we get six to ten 
phone calls, texts, or advertisements a week, people wanting to buy a house we have that is not for sale. We live there. <laughs> We're not moving. Every, it's all the time. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a world of almost 8 billion people, maybe a little bit over 8 billion people, with us, with, with us getting four to 10,000 advertisements every single solitary day, and we're prone to wander anyway. Who do I listen to? And how do I get there? You have here marketers, bloggers, webinars, radio hosts, politicians, and ministers. There's, we're not short of religious teaching and broadcasting in America. Some of it's good, some of it's terrible. So just because somebody says, okay, God said to me, and this, that doesn't mean it's true. It's just another voice saying, listen to me. No, listen to me. Now, in the middle of this passage, you have this. And just so you know, I put this up here in the King James, just because that's the way I memorized it when I was a kid. And this is my default. I hope I can say this now that I said that. I'm not looking. John, let's see, yeah, it's John, right? 10, 27 to 30. That's where we are, right? John 10. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So he says, in the midst of the craziness, my sheep hear my voice over all the insanity of this world. Over, and, if you, and if you question that you're getting those, that many, do you have one of these? I rest my case. We are bombarded every day with voices. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. Some of them are truthful. Some of them lie. So how do we find the one voice we need to listen to? That's the shepherd's voice. My sheep. My, my sheep. Hear my voice. I want to give you a little bit of content, and then I want to focus in on this. But I, I do want to cover two or three things in this larger passage. In verse 22, it says, The festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. The festival of dedication nowadays is called Hanukkah. So if you're wondering what time of year this was, it is the Festival of Lights or the Feast of Lights, but we call it Hanukkah. And let me give you some background on this. We looked at this when we were going through Daniel, if you remember the series on Daniel. 200 years before Christ, Greek soldiers captured and pillaged the Jerusalem temple, took its treasures and artifacts, and made it unusable for worship. In the winter of 165 to 164 B.C., a Jewish army led by Judas Maccabeus reclaimed the temple and rededicated it to the Lord. The festival of Hanukkah, which means dedication, marked this dedication of that event. Now, this is what was interesting to me. During this festival, priests would examine their commitment to service. And they would use two passages of Scripture to examine their commitment to service. One was Jeremiah 23, 1 through 4, which I read last week, which says to them, y'all are terrible shepherds. And Ezekiel 34, which we didn't look at because of time, the entire chapter God is saying to them, you're terrible shepherds. So they picked two passages of Scripture to commemorate Hanukkah, to commemorate the Festival of Lights, and both of those passages tell them, God is saying to them, you're not any good at this. This whole thing of shepherding people, you're terrible at it. It's funny to me that they picked that. And Jesus uses this, this shepherd thing from Ezekiel 34 to distinguish between himself as a good shepherd and Israel's current religious leaders as bad shepherds. Something else I want you to notice, look at verse 24 in your Bible. The Jews surrounded him. Now this is just almost a throwaway statement, but I was interested in the word surrounded. I don't know why, I just was interested in this word, so I looked it up in my Logos study Bible. 
Logos Bible software. And in verse 24, the Jews surrounded him. This is the Greek word which means closed in on him. Now, I don't know if you ever saw the great epic classic cartoon movie, Beauty and the Beast. How many of y'all have seen that? Okay. Some of you are like, I don't want to admit I'm a grown-up. I don't admit I like a cartoon. Yeah, I liked it. So there's a part in, the, in this cartoon movie where uh, Beauty, whatever her name is, I don't know. I don't care. Who? But, huh? Belle, see y'all? Okay, there you go. So Belle, is the, these wolves are getting around her and the beast jumps in and fights the wolves and saves her life. Yay. Yay beast, yay beauty. But what happened with those beasts when they, when they play the ominous music in a movie, you know something bad's fixing to happen. So they're playing the ominous music with the minor chords and these wolves are... Look what they're doing. Here's what, what does the Bible say in verse 24. The Jews surrounded him. That Greek word means to close in with the idea of doing harm. So when these guys were surrounding Jesus, they weren't just gathering around him because they really couldn't hear him. They really wanted to know more about what he was saying. They were getting around him so that he couldn't get away because they planned to kill him. They were going to grab him, tie him up, stone him to death, be done with him. So that's a little bit of background on this. Oh, there's one more thing. In verse uh, 30, it says, I and my Father are one. This was interesting to me. Let me read you something out of Deuteronomy. If you have a good study Bible, you probably have this in your footnotes or your cross-references. But this verse, I and my Father are one, will take you back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, which the Jewish people call the Shema. The Shema, S-H-E-M-A. They would say this every Shabbat, every Sabbath day. This is part of their worship. They would say this statement. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now watch. Listen, Israel, the Lord, all capital letters, that's Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord, our God, which is plural. Now, the, 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 Jewish, the, the Jewish scholars say, and I just read an article about this during Sunday school. The Jewish articles say that uh, evangelical Christians say that that means the Trinity. It doesn't mean the Trinity. And then they, to they said why they don't believe that means the Trinity. But, uh, but stay with me. Listen, O Israel, the Elohim or Yahweh, the Lord, our El El the Lord uh, Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord Jehovah or Yahweh is the Lord, our God, Elohim. The Lord is one. And God, or Elohim, is plural. But then he says the Lord is one. I believe, I believe that means the Trinity. Now, here, here's my point. Every Sabbath, they said this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus said to them, I and my Father are one. He, they knew what he was saying. They knew that he was referring back to the Shema. My mind goes in interesting places. Yours does too. I think if I was living in that day, if I was living in the day of Jesus, and I grew up in the temple, and I had a rabbi. And we said this every week. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I think at some point I would, my curiosity would take me to my rabbi, and I would say, Rabbi, I have a question. Can I have a question? question? Sure, John, what is it? What does one mean? What does one mean? The Lord is one. And he would tell me that means that there's only one. See, we are monotheistic. We believe in one God. In Jesus' day, the Greeks believed in many gods. So if my rabbi said to me, well, John, that just means the Lord is one. He's, there's one God. There's not a bunch of gods. I would probably go, okay. And I would go home, and I would think about it. And I would come back in a couple of weeks, and I would say, um, 
can I ask another question? And he would probably go, what is it? Rabbi, what does this mean, the Lord is one, in light of Genesis 1, 26, 27, where it says, then God, plural, plural, said, let us make man in our image. Rabbi, what does that mean with this? I just don't understand what it means. And he would probably say, I could tell you, but you'll never learn. You just need to go home and read about it. Meaning, I don't want to talk about this right now. So then I probably would come back the next Shabbat and say, Hey, Rabbi, I have another question. Um, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that God, plural, said man has become like one of us. What does that mean in light of the Lord our God, the Lord is one? Then probably the next Saturday I would come back and say, I got one more question. In Genesis 11 where they built the Tower of Babel and the Bible says that God said, God, plural, said man has become like one of. Let's confound. Let us. Let us. Let's. Let us confound their language they knew what Jesus meant what what boggles me is that okay look at my Bible from this place in Deuteronomy to this place in the gospel of John is about 4,000 years So for 4,000 years, nobody, it, it never occurred to anybody to say, maybe one means more than just one. Maybe there's a deeper meaning to this. I don't know. I just, I can't, and I know what it is. 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 You and I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us. I get this. I can read that and, and then go back and read Deuteronomy, read the Shema, and then read those three verses in Genesis and go, I know exactly what that means. The Trinity created the earth, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. The Trinity said man has become like one of us to know good and evil. The Trinity said we need to confuse their languages because they're getting too big for their britches. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is... One. Oh, by the way, if you go ahead and follow that, it is a classic. Let me go back for a second. This is classic for parenting. It starts with a Shema. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. It starts with the Shema. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. So, let's drill down on this. I'm going to use my hands. This hand is our responsibility. This hand is what God said he's going to do. Now watch this. This is going to be back and forth. My sheep, my sheep. That's a God thing. You are his sheep. You and I belong to him. Right? Right? I'm my own man. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm the master of my soul. No, you're not. You never were. 
Before Christ, you belong to Satan. Now you belong to Christ. You don't belong to you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My sheep. My sheep. Now watch this. This is our responsibility. Hear my voice. And I know them. That's God. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So there are seven things over here that Jesus does, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit does. There are two things that I'm supposed to do. Hear His voice. Follow Him. That's what He asks of me and of you. Now what we learned in the, the sermon last week was that the shepherd, a good shepherd, Knows his sheep, provides and protects his sheep, provides for them, protects them, sacrifices for them. Now we know that my part of this equation is to hear his voice and to follow him. My sheep hear my voice. In the midst of all the craziness of this world, I can hear God. I can hear from him. I can hear his voice. Here, 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 the word here, the word here, here, does that make sense? Means to perceive, to learn by hearing, to be informed. That's what it means in the Greek, to perceive, to learn by hearing, to be informed. I know this. I'm bad at this, I'm working on this, pray for me that I get better at this. I can hear and not listen. Can I get a witness on that? I can hear and not hear. This week, Tracy said something to me, she just said amen, she just said, yes Jesus, speak to his heart. This week she said something to me, she said, well, we're doing such and such and such. I said, that's the first time I'm hearing of this. She said, I told you this last week. No, you didn't. Oh, I did. No, sorry. Agree to disagree. (laughs) She starts to tell me about the conversation, but she's really good at remembering the conversation. I said this, and you said that, and then I said this, and you said that. We were standing in this kitchen, I said this, and you said, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, what, Uh uh-huh, yeah, what, yeah, right, right. (laughs) The more she explained to me the conversation, the more I remembered She did say that to me. I didn't hear her. My hand's on the Bible. Lord, I'll I'll try to do better. You can listen and not hear. This word means to perceive. My sheep perceive my voice. They learn by hearing my voice. They are in formed by my voice. So how does that happen? It happens through the Word of God. If you're not in the Bible, you're not going to hear God's voice. It's, it's ridiculous to think, that I want God to speak to me. Okay, cr- crack the dust off your Bible. That's how He does it. His Word, His Spirit, prayer, worship. Still silence, just being quiet and listening to the still small voice that's way down in you somewhere. That is the Lord trying to communicate with you and me. My sheep hear my voice. They hear my voice. I love to see a room full of teeny babies, toddlers, crawlers. They can't walk yet. Maybe they walk a little. I love to watch them when they're playing. They're crawling around. They're picking up anything in the floor and putting it in their mouth. Like, oh, that might be edible. It's a, it's a, 
It's a toy. Don't eat that. That I don't know what that is. It's off somebody's shoe. Don't eat that either. But I love to watch when mommy goes to the door and calls their name. And that kid goes. Have you ever seen this? And then when they turn around and they see mom, man, they forget everything. They just start crawling with their chubby little legs and their chubby little arms and chubby little hands. And they're just hauling the mail trying to get to her. Why? They heard, I know that voice. I know that voice. I know that voice. I would love to see a scientific, quantified, accurate study on video with this. I would love to see them put a bunch of babies in a room and have a bunch of mommies go to the door and say the same words. Just say, mommy's here. And watch what happens. Most other kids will go. No kid goes, well, you're not my mom, but you'll do till somebody comes along because I want to get out of here. Yeah, I'll go with you. No, they don't do that. You try to pick up a kid that's not yours and they don't know you, they're going to let you know in your ear at a high decibel just how much they're not enjoying this experience with you. No, I don't, I don't like you. I don't know you. This ain't happening. I'm pushing away from you while I'm screaming at bloody murder in your face. You are not my mother. Go away. I would love to see the, some work done on that. That would be cool. The sheep, the shepherd, uh, shepherds would often share a sheep pen with other shepherds. Like, it could be that that shepherd has 10 sheep, this shepherd's got 4 sheep, that shepherd may have 20 sheep, but you have a pen that would hold 50 sheep. So they all go in there for the night, and they would take turns sleeping across the door or standing guard or whatever, and then the next morning, they would go to the doorway, the opening, and they would call their sheep. Some people have said that they actually named the sheep, which may be possible. I know uh, I would tell the story if, if, I don't think he's here. I would tell the story about Chris Heron if he was here. Uh, Chris is funny. They, they decided to start, they have some land on their backyard, and they decided to start a little farm, and they have some goats, and they had some chickens, but they decided to get a cow. And uh, Carrie wanted to name it. He said, no. It's, 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 it's one. And after we butcher this one, the next one will be two. He said, I don't want to get attached to these things. This is for food. So I don't know how the, sh the shepherds did. I know they, some of them named their sheep, but I know that the sheep recognized the shepherd's voice. So it could be that morning the, this shepherd will go and make his familiar sound and his sheep will go, ah, I know that one. They wouldn't go. Jesus even says this in the beginning of John chapter 10. They wouldn't go with other shepherds. They went with their shepherd. They they knew their shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. And they would call their sheep, maybe by name. Maybe that, maybe that, whatever they do, to get the attention of those sheep. And they hear the voice of their shepherd. So my job is to hear my shepherd's voice. My sheep, he says, hear my voice. Okay, that's one of my jobs. The second one is I know them. And they follow me. Okay, that's my second job, to follow him. The word follow here, we looked at this in more detail. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth after me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Follow him. To, you, to be in the same way with, to accompany. And it was used of soldiers following the captain. They were used of students following their teacher. Now, all of that is introduction to get to this. This is where I wanted to go. This is where I've been heading for. So I know in a crazy world, I'm supposed to hear the shepherd's voice. Okay? I'm supposed to follow him. Now I'm going to step down. I've got to stay in here because of camera. Sometimes I wander off and the camera doesn't move. So people at home are listening to someone that's not there. 
Like if I go over here, the camera won't pick it up. So I'm going to try to stay right here. But I want you to see a progression of something. This is really important. As a pastor, I want you to follow Jesus. That's what I want for you. There's no greater place than to be following the shepherd. Be right on his heels, right there. If he stops, you're going to run into him. If he goes faster, you're going to run to catch up with him. You, there's no greater place to be than right there. And I think most Christian people know, yeah, I want to, I should do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a better job at that. I'm going to do, yeah, I'm, I need to start reading my Bible more. I need to pray some more. I need to be a little more faithful in church and the things of the Lord. And Yeah, okay, I should, I should work on that. But those seeds fall on stony ground and they don't last very long. You have to work backwards. Now watch. You're not going to follow him. Watch my body language here. You're not going to follow him if you don't know his voice. You're not going to do it. Now there are two words I want to give you here that aren't in the text, but they're, they, they, they've been a game changer for me. I'm not going to follow Jesus if I don't hear his voice. I'm not going to hear his voice if I don't trust him. And I'm not going to trust him if I don't take, spend time with him. It's time and trust that creates hearing and following. You're never going to hear the voice of God and follow Him if you don't spend time with Him to the point that you trust Him. Then when you hear His voice, you go, okay. And He says, all right, it's time to go. And we go, okay, how fast, how, what direction, where are we going? See, we want to be here. doesn't work. Just going here is not going to happen. You're not going to happen if you don't hear His voice. You're not going to hear His voice if you don't spend time with Him. That develops trust in him. I'm, I'm bordering on offending somebody I know, but one of the craziest uh, reality show things going on these days are these shows where people get married and don't know each other. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you watch that. If you do, find something better to do with your life. <laughs> I can't imagine walking into a room saying, I'm here to marry somebody. I don't care who it is. Just if you're available, I got a decent job, got a decent house, so let's see what we can do. When I was over at Grace Fellowship, part of what Buddy and I did every Sunday, we stood at the door when people came in, we talked to people, and we stood at the door when they were leaving, and we talked to them, encouraged them, just say, hey, good to see you, thanks for coming, pray with people that wanted prayer and that kind of stuff. So there was a guy... He was a senior adult. His wife had died. Tracy knows this is a true story. I pointed him out to her one Sunday. He comes up to me in the lobby of Grace Fellowship Church and says, I am here to meet women. He said, I'm, I'm widowed. My wife died. I'm lonely. And I came here to meet some women. I'm looking for a wife. I need I need to meet women, Christian women. I said, sir, we are not a dating service. <laughs> We're not. I mean, there are Christian women here, wonderful, godly Christian widows here, but we're not here to, like, help you find somebody. He came for weeks. Every Sunday morning he did this for probably six weeks, and then he stopped coming. But every Sunday he would come up to me and go, have you thought any more about this? I'm looking for women it's like saying, I'm looking for a new car. I'm looking for a washing machine. I'm looking for a woman. Okay. Lord bless you in your search, but I can't help you. How, how do these kind of things happen? You meet somebody. You know, you see them. In, I've heard some of y'all's stories that's so cool, like how you met. I love to ask people how they met. We had dinner with some wonderful friends the other night and asked them how they met. And they said, well, you're not going to like this, but here's how we met. I said, no, it's fine. You know, people meet how they meet. Told them how they met. There's another couple. I'm not, I'm not making eye contact anywhere. There are people in here. Like one person said, yeah, I'm, I met my wife at a pool in our apartment complex. I saw her. She, 
I just was swam over there and started talking to her, and one thing led to another. Most people don't get married just boom. They meet. They talk. They spend time together. They go, she's nice. He's nice. Okay. So maybe you get up enough courage to go, would you like to go uh, get pizza? Like go to a movie, go bowling or something? Yeah, okay. You do that. You have a nice evening. Hey, uh, I really enjoyed myself tonight. Yeah, I did too. That was fun. Um, can I call you in the next two, three days? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Hey, you want to go to a movie? So it, it just starts. It's time. Are you with me? It takes time to build trust. You cannot build trust without time. I'm not going to trust you if I just met you. Hi, I know you don't know me, but can I have your wallet? Hey, um, can I get your uh, social security number? I want to send you something. I know. Now, this is the gospel truth. I will tell you, we've got elders in this service. We had elders in that service. I, I would trust the elders of this church with my wallet and my keys. I've said to them, if something ever happens to me, just kind of be there for Tracy if she needs any advice. I trust them. I trust some of y'all. I'm developing that trust. But do you know what? I've been here 14 years with some of y'all. We've had time. You with me? To develop trust. It just takes time. The person I trust on the, this planet more than anybody else is Tracy. We dated three years. We've been married 46 years. She's never let me down once. So she has proven over time. You with me? She can be trusted I know her voice. It's easy to follow her. Does that make sense? It's easy when she says to me, yeah, I told you this last week. Uh, okay. <laughs> Listen, here's how, here's how you learn what trust really is. When you've had open heart surgery, and then three times a day, when you're in a drug-induced state, your wife is handing you fistfuls of pills. And you just are popping them in because she says, take this. I'm in my lazy boy. Take this? You want me to take this? Okay. She could have killed me. She could have given me flea pills, for all I know. But there's 46 years of marriage. There's three years of dating of time. Does that make sense? It takes time to build trust. It takes time and trust to hear the voice of God. That when He speaks to me, I go, yeah, I know your voice. When God walks into the nursery of my life and I hear Him say, John, that's my, that's my father. I know that voice. I've listened to that voice since I was eight years old. I'm 65, 66 now. I've heard that voice all my life. And he says, follow me. And I go, okay. If you haven't done these things, you're never going to do this. You might say, I'm going to follow him, but you're not going to follow him if you don't know his voice. You're not going to know his voice if you don't trust him, and you're not going to trust him if you don't spend some time with him. It all goes back to this book right here. What you do with the Bible determines what God's going to do with you. If the Bible's something you grab once a week, Bring it to church, you spend a few minutes in it, take it home, put it on the coffee table, and then you spend the rest of your days being bombarded with 4,000 to 10,000 messages every day from everybody else while you ignore the one voice you need to hear. You're never going to follow Him. You're never going to enjoy abundant life. I came, the thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. And what happens? I give to them, who? My sheep, eternal life. Everybody, hear me, this is important. Everybody's not going to heaven. Those people who 
Jesus is their shepherd who they know his voice. They have a relationship with him. They've accepted him by grace through faith. They are listening to his voice. They're following him. That's, this promise is for them. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Great thing about being a Christian, if you're born once, you're born twice, you die once. If you're born and you're born again, you die once. If you're born once, you die twice. The only person in all of human history that's, that was born twice and died twice, we're going to look at it next week, his name was Lazarus. He's the only person in human history that was born twice and died twice. Jesus wrote, I don't want to get into next week, but, you know, you're Lazarus. I mean, you're kind of, your, body, your soul and spirit are in heaven and your body's corroding and all of a sudden you hear Lazarus come forth and you go, oh man, do I have to go through this all over again? Are you kidding me? But if you're a Christian, you're born once. You're born physically, but you're, you're, you're born once physically. You're born twice physically and spiritually. You're born again. You'll die once unless Jesus comes. If you're not saved, you're born once. You're going to die twice. You're going to die physically. You're going to die spiritually. My sheep, hear my voice, I give to them eternal life. Just them. Not everybody else. There's not 30 roads to heaven and we're all going to meet up there sooner or later. Nope. There's one road. There's one way. There's one truth. There's one life, there's one bread, there's one door, there's one light, there's one vine, there's one resurrection. It's Jesus. And at the end of it all, with thousands of voices yammering at you every single day, at the end of it all, there's only one voice you need to listen to. There's only one voice that's going to matter what he says. And it's Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? He's the only voice in this world of craziness. He is the only voice we need to be seeking with all of our heart. It's His voice. I want to follow Him. When everybody else is running off the bridge, I want to follow Him. Oh, I've got to know His voice. Okay, I want to know His voice. Well, that's going to take some trust. Yeah, I, I can do that. I want to trust him, okay? Just going to take some time. It's not that hard. We're just lazy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that when I was eight years old, you, your voice reached out to an eight-year-old kid in Opelika, Alabama, playing in his tree, his favorite tree, on a Saturday afternoon. And you spoke to me. You called me to salvation. My parents led me to Christ. I've never been the same. And Lord, I know that I am prone to wander. We all are. Yet Lord, help us to spend the time necessary to build the trust necessary to hear Your voice so that we may follow You Lord, you're our shepherd. We shall not want. You make us lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside still waters. You restore our soul. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. Thank you for being our shepherd. Thank you for being a good shepherd. Thank you for being a great shepherd. Thank you for being the chief shepherd. We love you. We worship you. We praise you. We adore you. Speak, Lord. For your servants are listening. We want to hear you. More than anybody else, we want to hear you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.